Hatchet, Chapter 16, Part 1 <clears throat> And now he stood at the end of the long part of the lake and was not the same, would not be the same again. There had been many first days, first era day, when he had used thread from his tattered old piece of windbreaker and some pitch from a stump to put slippers of feather on a dry willow shaft and make an arrow that would fly correctly. Not accurately, he never got really good with it, but fly correctly so that if a rabbit or a fool bird sat in one place long enough, close enough, and he had enough arrows, he could hit it. That brought first rabbit day. When he killed one of the large rabbits with an arrow and skinned it as he had the first bird, cooked it the same to find the meat as good, not as rich as the bird, but still good, and there were strips of fat on the back of the rabbit that cooked into the meat to make it richer. Now he went back and forth between rabbits and fool birds when he could, filling them with fish in the middle. Always hungry. I am always hungry, but I can do it now. I can get food, and I know I can get food, and it makes me more. I know what I can do. He moved closer to the lake to stand to a stand of nut brush. These were thick bushes with little stickler pods that held green nuts, nuts that he thought he might be able to eat, but they weren't ripe yet. He was out for a full bird, and they liked to hide in the base of the thick part of the nut brush, back in where the stems were close together and provided cover. In the second clump, he saw a bird, moved close to it, paused when he heard feathers came, when, when the head feathers came up, and it made a sound like a cricket, a sign of alarm just before it flew, then moved closer when the feathers went down and the bird relaxed. He did this four times, never looking at the bird directly, moving toward it at an angle so that it seemed he was moving off to the side. He had perfected this method after many attempts, and it worked so well that he had actually caught one with his bare hands until he was standing less than three feet from the bird, which was frozen in a hiding attitude in the brush. The bird held for him when he put an arrow to the bow, one of the feathered arrows, not a fish arrow, and drew and released. It was a clean miss, and he took another arrow out of the cloth pouch at his belt, which he made from a piece of his windbreaker sleeve, tied at one end to make a bottom. The full bird sat still for him, and he did not look directly at it until he drew a second arrow and aimed and released and missed again. This time the bird jerked a bit and the arrow stuck, stuck next to it so close, stuck next to it so close it almost brushed its breast. Brian only had two more arrows and he debated moving slowly to change the spear over to his right hand and use that to kill the bird. One more shot, he decided. He would try it again. He slowly brought another arrow out put it on the string and aimed and released, and this time saw the flurry of feathers that meant he had made a hit. He had a made hit. The bird had been struck off center and was flopping around wildly. Brian jumped on it, grabbed it, and slammed it against the ground once sharply to kill it. Then he stood and retrieved his arrows and made sure they were all right and went down to the lake to wash the blood off of his hands. He kneeled at the water's edge and put the dead bird and his weapons down and dipped his hands into the water. It was very nearly the last act of his life. Later, he would not know why he started to turn, some smell or sound, a tiny brushing sound, but something caught his ear or nose, and he began to turn, and had his head half around when he saw a brown wall of fur detach itself from the forest to his rear and come down on him like a runaway truck. He just had time to see that it was a moose. He knew them from pictures, but did not know, could not guess how large they were when it hit him. It was a cow, and she had horns, but she took him to the, in the left side of the back with her forehead, took him and threw him out into the water, and then came after him to finish the job. He had another half second to fill his lungs with air, and she was on him again, using her head to drive him down into the mud at the bottom. Insane, he thought, just that, the word, insane. Mud filled his eyes, his ears. The horn boss and the moose drove him deeper and deeper into the bottom muck, and suddenly it was over, and he felt alone. He sputtered to the surface, sucking air and fighting panic, and when he wiped the mud and water out of his eyes and cleared them, he saw the cow standing sideways to him, not ten feet away, calmly chewing on a lily pad, lily pad root. She didn't appear to even see him, or didn't seem to care about him, and Brian turned carefully and began to swim and crawl out of the water. As soon as he moved, the hair on her back went up and she charged him again, 
seizing her head and brought fists this time, slamming him back and down into the water. On his back this time, he strained the air out of his lungs and hammered on her head with his fist and filled his throat with water and she left again. Once more he came to the surface, but he was hurt now, hurt inside, hurt in his ribs and he stayed hunched over, pretended to be dead. She was standing again, eating. Brian studied her out of one eye, looking to the bank with the other, wondering how seriously he was injured, wondering if she would let him go home this time insane. He started to move ever so slowly. Her head turned and her hair went up again. Her back hair went up again, like the hair on an angry dog. And he stopped, took a slow breath. The hair went down and she ate. Move, hair up, stop, hair down. Move, hair up, a half foot at a time until he was at the edge of the water. He stayed on his hands and knees Indeed, was so hurt, he wasn't sure he could walk anyway, and she seemed to accept that and let him crawl slowly out of the water and up into the trees and brush. When he was behind a tree, he stood carefully and took stock. His legs seemed all right, but his ribs were hurt bad. He could only take short breaths, and then he had a jabbing pain, and his right shoulder seemed to be wrenched somehow. Also, his bow and spear and full bird were in the water. At least he could walk. And he, had, and he had just about decided to leave everything when the cow moved out of the deeper water and left him as quickly as she'd come, walking down along the shoreline in the shallow water with her long legs making sucking sounds when she pulled them free of the mud. Hanging on a pine limb, he watched her go, half expecting her to turn and come back to run him over again. But she kept going, and when she was well gone from sight, he went to the bank and found the bird, then waded out a bit and got his bow and spear. Neither of them was broken, and the arrows, incredibly, were still on his belt in the pouch, although messed up with mud and water. It took him most of an hour to work his way back around the lake. His legs worked well enough, but if he took two or three fast steps, he would begin to breathe deeply, and the pain from his ribs would stop him, and, when he, and he would have to lean against a tree until he could slow back down to, to shallow breathing. She had done more damage than he had originally thought, the insane cow. No sense at all to it, just madness. When he got to the shelter, he crawled inside and was grateful that the coals were still glowing and that he had and that he had thought to get wood first thing in the morning to be ready for the day. Grateful that he had thought to get enough wood for two or three days at a time. Grateful that he had fish nearby if he needed to eat. Grateful, finally, as he dozed off, that he was alive.